it has a lightweight monocoque chassis, high revving 1.5 liter Honda engine, and corners like a... Who am I kidding? You saw the thumbnail. The Honda Fit, an unlikely toge hero. Known in other markets as the Honda Jazz, its subcompact layout squeezes ample performance into a modest chassis, perfect for the winding mountain roads and narrow city streets of Japan. Not too much unlike the A86, the Fit is a typical commuter car with racing pedigree and technology. But unlike the 86, I don't believe the Fit is recognized for what it really is. Today, I show you why the Fit has earned a spot at the top. Today, I show you what makes it so great. Built on the shoulders of giants, the Fit has evolved through four unique generations, but we only care about the first three. Hitting the streets of Japan in 2001, the Fit was the new kid on the block. It had a brand new chassis developed using the Honda Global small car platform of requirements. This gave it a rigid unibody design with low floor that maximized cabin space and cargo capacity. The small footprint combined with the relatively spacious interior made the Fit an instant hit. For power, Honda also decided to give the Fit its own original engine, the Honda L series. The GD3 featured an L15A1, a 1.5 liter timing chain driven single cam VTEC engine making about 100 horses. The motor was specifically designed to fit in the reduced space of the chassis engine bay and took technology from the D-Series motors and even the legendary B18 from the Integra Type R. Power was fed to the front wheels by a 5-speed manual transmission as standard, with options for a CVT or 5-speed automatic. In the US, we didn't get the GD3 until 2007, but when it arrived, it was essentially the same exact car as the Japanese domestic market model. It was even manufactured in Suzuka. If it ain't broke, improve it. Incremental changes were made all over. It got a width and wheelbase extension alongside a small bump to power. It still had the same 1.5 liter engine, but with small changes made to push an extra 10 to 20 horsepower from the motor. This version was known as the L15A7 and is actually used in the Formula Ford class of open wheel racing. But this is only a regulation allowed in the US. Where big changes were made was the unibody. With a redesign, Honda managed to stiffen the chassis by a whopping 164%. These changes may have been the reason Mugen took notice of the fit with performance in mind. They created the F154 SC, a second gen fit with everything you could want. A supercharger pushing the motor to 150 horsepower, a custom wide body kit, and handling modifications on all four corners. Honda is a company built around efficiency. With the third gen fit, that's exactly what we got. The L15 engine grabbed an extra cam and 10 more horsepower. The chassis was strengthened yet again with a monocoque and space frame design making it not only stiffer and thus safer, but slightly lighter than even the first gen GD3 fully loaded. However, there is one issue with the GK5. They redesigned the rear suspension to a torsion beam axle. This meant a more reliable, more compact, and cheaper system at the cost of handling and adjustment capabilities. It's the year 2000 and the world has entered a fresh new millennia. Times are changing, especially in the global car market. Cars are getting safer, more fuel efficient, and of course bigger. Over in Japan, the ubiquitous Honda Civic has a problem. It's become too big to qualify for Japan's strict small car tax exemption. If Honda loses market dominance in their homeland, there's no telling how far behind they'll fall globally. This is where the Honda Global small car platform comes into being. It's a set of chassis requirements meant to maximize space, comfort, and efficiency while maintaining a compact size. The first chassis to be developed on this platform are the fourth generation Honda City and the first generation Honda Fit. When designing something to be both compact and safe, it needs to be as strong as possible. Due to this byproduct of the global small car platform's requirements, the Fit has one of the most rigid chassis ever developed for a mass production vehicle. 
The fuel tank is located underneath the front seats for space saving, but also provides balance and weight. The low slung floor made to maximize cabin space also gives a low center of gravity. All this combined with a punchy four-cylinder VTEC engine, classic Honda 5-speed manual, and a curb weight a little over a metric ton makes the fit a mighty foe in the corners. Speaking of corners... Although the fit never competed in any Honda-sponsored capacity, it has found great success in the private sector of racing. Gridlife hosts the Sunday Cup, a series of time attack racing inspired by the previous spec fit series that allows only cars with a 25 to 1 power to weight ratio to compete. The dominant car in the class is, of course, the first gen GD3 Honda fit. Looking to get into amateur rally? The fit might be your perfect chassis for the job. In the 2012 Australian Rally Championship, a second gen GE8 would take home first place for the two-wheel drive class. In the 2019 Hundred Acre Wood Rally, a 3rd gen GK5 would also take home first place in the regional limited two-wheel drive class. The fit was Honda's attempt to create the perfect compact car. I believe they succeeded. If you're in the market for a perfect daily driver that can also handle a day at the track or night in the hills, the fit may just be the perfect option. Its legacy lives on with the GK5, which is still in production, and the 4th gen GR, which began production in 2020 for the Japanese, European, and Chinese markets. It retains the L15 motor, but is heading the way of full electrification in the near future. What I hope I leave you with today is a newfound respect for a vehicle that you may have typically overlooked in day-to-day -day life. I hope you discovered what makes it so great. Before we end today, I have some debts that desperately need to be paid. Shout out to Cytex, Jacob Allen, AK Joy J, and Dan on Patreon. They're all patrons that joined the Patreon way back in 2019 that I never gave a shout out to, and for that, I apologize. Speaking of Patreon, I'm trying to post content there regularly as I get back into the swing of things, so if you're willing to give me another chance, go take a look. With that out of the way, I thank you very much for watching.